Kate Environmental Incorporated regarding the Data Centers LLC project. I will remind uh, those on council and our presenters this evening to please make sure you are speaking into the microphone as we are recording the meeting this evening. Carol, if you would please begin with the introduction. Yes, um, Mayor and Council, as you're aware, um, we did authorize um, our request to hire an environmental consultant in January of this year. Liberty Environmental was then, was then engaged to um, complete the independent review of the Data Centers LLC air, air permit application as it currently stands. The review has now been completed and has been made available to Mayor and Council as well as to the public. Um, Mr. Gavin um, Beback is here today from Liberty Environmental to share the report. Um, and with that said, um, Mr. Beback, we can begin. Ron? Well, good evening, uh, Council. Thanks for inviting me. Uh, I'm Gavin Beback. I'm a principal and owner of Liberty Environmental. We're a 25-person environmental consulting firm headquartered in Oregon, Pennsylvania, and we have offices in Lancaster and Philadelphia. Um, I was retained by the city to provide uh, independent review and comments on the air quality permit application submitted by the Data Center LLC, which I'm going to call TEC tonight. Uh, the, the application we submitted to NRAC in um, November 2015. Uh, before I discuss my report, which finalized and submitted to the city uh, about a week and a half ago. I'm going to review uh, what my scope was and wasn't. Uh, the scope was to look at the air quality permit application, the air quality impacts uh, assessment that was provided by TDC's um, consultant. Um, but I was not tasked with reviewing noise issues, um, visual issues, uh, water usage, stormwater, uh, gas pipeline, I understand they're going to bring two gas pipelines into the facility. Uh, safety matters or environmental justice. Um, so there's a lot to environmental uh, impacts review. I'm focused really on uh, air quality and air pollution, which as I'll explain is important because uh, for a major uh, air pollution source like this, uh, you have to obtain an air permit prior to construction. Some of the other media water permits you can get uh, prior to operation. Air is very important that you get the permit in hand before you break ground and start construction. Another thing I uh, just wanted to note is we have not provided an evaluation of the data center's uh, power needs. Um, we have not done a sizing evaluation to determine whether they will really need a 279 megawatt power plant. We started from the assumption that uh, TDC's um, projections were correct and they do need 279 megawatts. And the question we are asking is, are they proposing to produce this electricity in the cleanest possible way with the lowest uh, air quality impacts? <laughs> and uh, before I dive into the report and all the details of uh, air permitting and pollutants, which is very <coughs> sort of convoluted and technical, um, I'm just going to give you a certain executive summary. Um, and I try to distill it down to a few words. Uh, several years ago, I was at a public hearing regarding landfill gas uh, to energy project. And I reviewed uh, the air permit application, and my assessment was that the project was uh, green but not clean. It was a good use of landfill gas to produce electricity, uh, but it certainly wasn't a clean way of making electricity. Burning landfill gas much dirtier than burning natural gas can't use air pollution controls. Um, and it occurred to me in reviewing my report and um, this application and the representations that TDC has made uh, regarding the project, that this project is to some extent clean, but it's certainly not green. And what I mean by that is they're proposing to install a uh, combined cycle gas-fired power plant uh, with state-of-the-art pollution controls. So to that extent, it's a, it's a clean project. It's very similar to recently permitted large gas-fired power plants. Could it be cleaner? Yes, and we have some issues with some of their um, proposed air emissions limits. Um, they're proposing very large um, internal combustion engines, for example, that are much dirtier than combustion turbines. But they may have a need for those engines um, for, for black starts and that sort of thing. Um, 
But certainly the project is, is, is not green. It, it's a fossil fuel fired power plant. It's not renewable energy. Uh, there are claims about it being CHP or combined uh, heat and power are questionable in light of um, some University of Delaware's recent statements that they're not going to purchase steam um, from TDC. So certainly the claims that it's, it's, uh, it's extremely green, low uh, carbon footprint um, are, are, are questionable. So from that standpoint, um, my assessment is this is a relatively clean project, could be cleaner, um, but it's not green. Um, what I'm going to do today, just in the way of process, I'm just going to talk a little bit about my qualifications and then I'm going to review the project, what they're proposing in terms of air emission sources. I'm going to review the air permit process, how it works with DENREC and US EPA, um, and the requirements of be met by the applicant. Uh, then I'm going to discuss my findings sort of on a pollutant by pollutant basis, and then finally my conclusions and recommendations. Um, because there is so much jargon in air quality, uh, from pollutants to the various air regulations, um, I'm going to invite counsel to interrupt me at any time if you have any questions so I can through the presentation. Um, so to start, in terms of my experience, I've been in the air quality field for over 25 years. Um, started with the Pennsylvania DEP, uh, Bureau of Air Quality, where it was an air quality specialist, uh, inspecting facilities, assessing compliance with uh, regulations, writing notices of violation and that sort of thing. Um, after four years with uh, Pennsylvania State Agency, I went into um, consulting and worked for a number of consulting firms. With two partners, I started Liberty Environmental 10 years ago. And I had the air quality practice at Liberty. We had six people who focused on air quality management matters. We prepare air permit applications um, for industrial sources. We also provide um, comments on air permit applications on behalf of municipalities. We do a lot of work with uh, Berks County, uh, Pennsylvania, uh, independent um, air permit review work, um, air quality planning assistance. And over the past 10 years, I've reviewed um, permits for major sources varying from cement plants, um, lead smelters, uh, battery plants, we're blessed with a lot of industry in Berks County. Uh, landfill gas and energy projects, as I mentioned, uh, chemical and uh, metal facility air permit applications. And I'm intimately familiar with air quality permit strategies that are used by consultants, uh, the pitfalls, fatal flaws associated with permitting a major source, um, little tricks of the trade and how you avoid some of the most unpleasant um, uh, portions of it. Uh, 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 air permitting and air quality impacts assessments. Uh, and I think that's helpful in this regard because I can certainly see uh, what the applicant has done to sort of make this life a little bit simpler when it comes to this air permit. I've also been involved with uh, air toxics uh, and risk assessment um, work. Um, our firm operated a, an air toxics monitoring station in Berks County for five years and we took that data and conducted an inhalation risk assessment. So I think with that uh, background, uh, it's uh, certainly useful when reviewing this complex air permit application submitted by TDC. So what is TDC proposing um, and, and why are they submitting an air permit application? Well, they're proposing a natural gas fired power plant to produce electricity um, for their proposed data center operations. And the power plant's going to be built um, Gavin, can I just interrupt you for a minute? Would you mind holding the microphone in your hand? Because when you turn your head, it's not recording properly. Sure. Thank you. Thank right. you. Um, so what TDC is proposing is uh, a series of um, gas-fired power systems. Uh, the reason they're proposing so many, my understanding is, is that they're proposing to phase construction over several years. Uh, to get to... Um, ultimately 279 megawatts or thereabouts of uh, electricity um, generation capacity. We're proposing seven large gas-fired combustion turbines, which are essentially huge jet engines. They're rated at 23 megawatts each. They're proposing three very large gas-fired internal combustion engines, which are essentially like an emergency generator, although these would be huge emergency generators. Uh, they're rated at about 17 megawatts each. And they're going to take the hot exhaust gases from the turbines 
and the engines, and they're going to produce steam, what's called heat recovery steam generators, FERSIGs, HRSG. And that steam is going to be used to produce more electricity with high pressure steam um, turbines. And uh, they're going to produce somewhere around 20 megawatts each, three of those steam turbines. And the remainder of the steam is going to be used to run chilling systems. They need chilled air for the servers and the data center in the summer. And they're also going to use some of the um, chilling capacity to pre-cool the air of the gas turbines, which makes them more efficient in the summer. Uh, in the winter, they're going to have an excess of steam. They proposed uh, selling that steam to the University of Delaware. My understanding is that's not going to occur now. So one of the questions we have is, is um, they promoted this project as a combined heat and power CHP project, but that really relies on having a host for the low pressure steam. So most CHP projects are located in cities, uh, on colleges, uh, campuses, but where there's a lot of buildings available that can use the steam for heating. So that's one of our key um, issues and concerns with, with the project as it's been advertised. As I say, they're proposing phase construction. We're not quite sure what the um, time frame is of the phasing. I've seen projections of what they're going to put in over time, but I haven't really seen whether this is going to be over 10 years or three years. Uh, that's important from an air permitting perspective because you can't just get an air permit and have it last forever. If you have a lapse in construction of more than 18 months, you need to reassess um, pollution controls, best available control technology. So you can't obtain an air permit for 10 years worth of construction. You need to have a steady um, uh, program of construction that's not interrupted in order to receive a single air permit. So one of the concerns we have is what, how, how long is this space construction going to occur? Um, the combustion turbines and the engines are going to be equipped with catalysts. Um, really are state-of-the-art pollution controls. Uh, we've done a thorough review of other gas-fired power plants, and no one's really going beyond what the, the uh, TDC is proposing in terms of catalysts. There's two types that they're proposing to install, uh, what's called SCR, which is selective catalytic reduction, uh, which requires ammonia as a reagent. Uh, that's used to control NOx emissions, nitrogen oxides, or NOx. Um, Unfortunately, ammonia is essential for that, so you can either use anhydrous ammonia, which is rather hazardous, or aqueous ammonia, or you can use urea. But ultimately, um, ammonia is what's used as the reagent uh, in the hot exhaust gases and the catalyst. They're proposing to use aqueous ammonia uh, with an ammonia content of less than 20%. Uh, so there will be an ammonia storage tank associated with this facility. I don't know the capacity. I, I didn't see that in the application. Um, in addition to the SCR catalyst to control NOx emissions, uh, they're proposing oxidation catalysts, which are like the catalysts in your car. Uh, they're going to be used to control carbon monoxide, or CO, and also volatile organic compounds, VOC. And most importantly, some of the VOCs are toxics. Uh, formaldehyde, in particular, is a sort of risk driver when you look at um, gas-fired um, combustion sources. Um, there's no formaldehyde in the natural gas, but it forms secondarily as a product of incomplete combustion. So they're proposing oxidation catalysts that will reduce CO, VOC, and these uh, air toxics um, on each of the turbines and the uh, internal combustion engine. So they say they'll have an ammonia tank, and they also have cooling towers. Um, it'll be equipped with uh, drift eliminators. Cooling towers are sources of particulate matter emissions. Um, there's always dissolved solids in water, uh, even municipal water, and you can't just filter it out. So what happens with cooling tower, as you go through cycles of cooling, the dissolved solids are emitted as particulate matter, along with um, visible steam at times. Um, they're proposing um, high efficiency drift eliminators to minimize particular emissions from the cooling towers. So the emission rates are actually pretty low from their cooling towers. Um, although they're, they are lower, the cooling towers, than the stacks associated with the combustion sources. So in summary, that, that's what proposed to be installed if you add up all the megawatts of these um, turbines, engines, and um, 
the steam turbines, you get 279 megawatts. Now, the interesting thing about this project is it's not like a base load power plant where they're going to produce 279 megawatts as much as they can. They um, say they only need about 130 megawatts for the data center once it's all built out. Uh, they're proposing to sell between 50 and 70 megawatts uh, to the grid, which in this case I understand is the city. And the reason for this discrepancy, well, one of the reasons, according to the application, is they need redundancy to ensure that the facility always has electric and has backup generation capacity in case one of the turbines fails or one of the engines fails. So they refer to this as N plus 2, where I guess N is the number of engines they need at one time, 2 is the extra that they need on standby. So because of this N plus 2 redundancy, I think that's caused a fair amount of confusion. It certainly confused me looking at their application as to what the rated capacity is versus what they're actually going to use versus what they want to sell. Um, but that is apparently part of the um, complexity of operating data center when you're not in the grid. And by the way, my experience with data centers is with much smaller facilities that operate on the grid and they usually have diesel-fired emergency backup engines in case they lose power, they turn them on. Are diesel-fired engines very clean? The new ones are, but they're certainly not as clean as, as gas-fired um, turbines and engines that are being proposed. On the other hand, TDC proposes to run these 24-7, um, whereas most data centers operate, as I say, on the grid and only operate the um, emergency backup in case of an emergency or for exercising. So are, are the proposed sources the cleanest available? No. Uh, combined cycle gas power plant is in fact cleaner, certainly than the, the very large uh, internal combustion engines they're proposing. If they weren't to run the combustion engines and operate the plant as a combined cycle power plant, sure, they would be about as clean as you could be burning fossil fuels producing electricity. Uh, there are some limits that could be lower and I think should be lower, um, but it's not because they're not proposing the right pollution controls, it's just that they haven't proposed limits that are um, uh, as low as they should be. And some of these limits are not established by federal and state law, they're established case by case through what's called the back to layer process. So it's difficult to know exactly what the limits should be, but you have to do a view of the industry, uh, recently permitted sources of a similar size, and you have to propose at least as, as stringent limits as have been permitted for other facilities. And our findings are some of their pollutant levels are not as low as they should be. Uh, ammonia, for example, they're proposing a relatively high level of ammonia emissions. Um, we think that should be lower. Uh, what happens is when you use these SCR controls is you inject ammonia and you have some ammonia slip. Uh, in the case of TDC, they're proposing 7 parts per million ammonia slip, which amounts to 70 tons a year of ammonia emissions, which is real, relatively high. We've seen other power plants um, with 2 to 5 parts per million, so about half the ammonia level. So we think the ammonia slip could be lowered. Um, and one of the fundamental concerns we have with, with the application is that they do not provide um, vendor guarantees. Uh, from the catalysts, which are the pollution control systems, or from the engines or the turbines. We think once they firm up what they want to install and get guarantees from the vendors, they will get lower emission rates than what they're proposing. Um, but we see that as a deficiency in something they need to correct uh, before a permit's issue, is, is to get guaranteed emission rates, not estimated emission rates. Um, so could it be cleaner? Yes. Uh, but fundamentally, they are proposing pollution controls that are state-of-the-art. Um, and as I say, we expect some slightly lower emissions for some pollutants uh, once they've obtained vendor guarantees. That's sort of my overview of what they're proposing to install. I thought I'd talk a little bit about the air permit process and then my findings. Um, the air permit process uh, for a major source of air pollution um, <coughs> like this one, and the major source is defined based on how many tons per year of, of pollution are you going to emit. So depending on the pollutant, there are different major source thresholds. Um, but in the case of this facility, it's clearly a major source. Um, 
their proposed emission rates of NOx and VOC, which are both precursor pollutants to ozone uh, pollution, both of those uh, exceed 25 tons per year, and that's the major source threshold uh, here in Newcastle County, where we're in an ozone non-attainment area. So they're major for NOx and VOC. Um, they're also major for CO2, carbon dioxide, which is a new air pollutant um, under the Clean Air Act, relatively new. Uh, carbon dioxide, or CO2, is being regulated under the Clean Air Act as a result of a Supreme Court decision several years ago. So, uh, major sources of CO2 emissions, and major is defined as 100,000 tons per year, uh, must obtain a federal air permit. So this facility is proposing CO2 emissions well in excess of 100,000 tons a year. So they have to obtain a, a major federal air permit from that standpoint alone. So they're major for CO2 um, and also for NOx and VOC. And what happens under the federal uh, major source air permit program, uh, first of all, it's a pre-construction permit program. So you need to obtain this permit in hand before you commence construction. So it's quite different from water and waste permits. Um, and it can be infuriating. My clients are trying to build uh, major sources or modify manufacturing plants. And I tell them you've got to do air quality impacts assessments, modeling. You may have to collect on-site um, uh, pollution data uh, before you get your permit. Um, they find that hard to believe because it can take uh, one and a half to two years to get one of these permits. Um, but that's the way it is. It's a complex program where you have to get the buy-off of the state regulators, in this case DENREC, US EPA oversees them and can veto the permit if it's not written correctly. And there's, of course, public involvement. In some cases, with these major air permits, you also need federal land managers from the national parks and wilderness areas that you might be impacting when you're there with you. So it involves multiple regulatory agencies um, their permits. But the federal major um, source permitting program is referred to as NSR or New Source Review. And under New Source Review, there are two types of, of permits. For, and it depends on um, the pollutant and the area in which you're going to locate and whether that area is classified as attainment or non attainment for that particular pollutant. So the one program is PSD, Prevention of Significant Deterioration, and that applies um, to pollutants for which the area is classified as attainment. And under PSD, you have to conduct an air quality impacts assessment, an air quality modeling assessment using computer modeling. And TDC did that for two pollutants, PM10, which is coarse particulate matter, as we call it, um, versus fine particulate matter, which is PM2.5. But anyway, they conducted an air quality impacts assessment for PM10 and for nitrogen dioxide, NO2. So a trip to ESD permitting for those two pollutants conducted a modeling analysis, and the other um, component of PSD is BACT, Best Available Control Technology. So they have conducted a BACT analysis and determined how low they can go for PM10 and for NOx or NO2. So that's PSD, um, and, and also their CO2 emissions are subject to, to PSD, um, but just with respect to BACT, yeah, you don't model CO2 uh, because there's no national ambient air quality standard for it. But the other part of New Source Review is non-attainment uh, NSR, and that applies um, in areas that are classified non-attainment. So here in Newcastle County, you're classified as non-attainment for ozone. Uh, it's a measure of smog, it's sort of a summertime pollutant and non-attainment for fine particulate, or PM2.5, um, which is sometimes referred to as soot, but very fine particulate matter, um, aerosols that can get sort of deep into the lungs. So for ozone, as I mentioned, they ex the project's exceeding 25 tons for NOx and DOC, ozone precursors. So what you have to do under non-attainment new source review is instead of modeling and looking at air quality impacts, you must get emissions offsets. So because the area is dirty or ready um, for these non-attainment pollutants, you have to offset all of your increases, all of your emissions, to show a net benefit in the area. So with respect to NOx and VOC, they're proposing to purchase emissions offsets 
prior to operating the planes. And so they have to offset the entire amount of NOx and VOC, the entire ton per year, at a ratio of 1.3 to 1. So where do these offsets come from? Well, believe it or not, they come from previous plants that have shut down, like perhaps Chrysler generated emissions offsets when they shut down their facility. They certainly hope they do, because they're worth money. Um, but they might have been nice and donated them, and not, not banking. Um, or uh, other facilities may have over-controlled um, sources in the past and generated uh, offsets. But you need to go out and find emissions offsets and show a net reduction in the airship. And so they're doing that for NOx and VOC. Um, the other pollutant I mentioned we're not attainment for, though, is PM2.5. And in that case, um, they decided to avoid the need for offsets. And my understanding is, I'm still waiting for details from Denmark, but there are very little few, if any, offsets available for PM2.5. So what they've done, and I've done this before too, so I can see why, is, is they've capped emissions at the entire facility just under 100 tons per year in order to avoid the need for offsets. Um, one of our comments is, um, that's clever doing that, um, but we believe there's a potential for a significant impact of PM2.5 at that 97 ton level, uh, based on some modeling we've done. So we believe, even though they've cleverly capped it under 100 tons, um, there's, there's a potential need to offset these emissions. Um, if not a regulatory need, certainly a good neighbor uh, would, would, would offset the, this, this large amount of emissions. Um, so that's sort of the overview of the air permit process. You have PSD, you have non attainment resource review. Um, you need to show that you've got these offsets, you've got fact in place. Uh, for the non attainment pollutants, you also need to show that you have a layer, which is the lowest achievable emission rate. Layer is more stringent than fact. So they provided a layer analysis and a back analysis. Um, but it's important to note that, that this is a federal permit program administered by the state. So DENREC will issue the air permit, but US EPA has oversight and can and will comment on the application. And if the permit is not issued to their liking, they can uh, essentially veto the permit. Um, they've got their own comment period of 45 days that runs in parallel to the public comment period of 30 days. So EPA can, uh, in theory, appeal the permit, as can the public, um, if, it, if it's not uh, issued properly by Denver. So that is the permit process in a nutshell. Uh, there's a lot of details involved with how you do a modeling analysis and some of our comments um, pertaining to the air quality impact analysis. Um, getting to their actual air permit application, uh, key elements of it, as I've discussed, is, is, is they're proposing to obtain offsets for NOx and VOC. They're proposing very low NOx limits of two parts per million um, from the combustion turbines with the use of catalysts. That certainly is, is state of the art and, and meets limits that recent repermitted uh, gas fired power plants have, have been issued. Um, they're proposing this 100 ton cap on PM 2.5 emissions to avoid offsets. Uh, we have some concerns with that. Um, they conducted a PM 10 and NO2 air quality impacts modeling analysis. Um, we have some concerns with that modeling analysis, but at the end of the day, they're showing very low impacts of those two pollutants. And there doesn't seem to be an issue with uh, their meeting the National Ambient Air Quality Standards and other um, provisions that pertain to air quality impacts for those two pollutants. We have more concern with PM 2.5, which they did not model. We'll get to. Um, <clears throat> CO2. They proposed an efficiency standard for carbon dioxide. Um, and essentially, they proposed an extremely low value uh, in terms of pounds of carbon dioxide per megawatt. Uh, power plant, gas fired power plants are in the sort of 900 pound. Um, of CO2 per megawatt range. The US EPA recently proposed standards for new power plants in the range of 1,000 to 1,100 pound uh, per megawatt. Extremely controversial standards um, because they're going to um, lead to whole power plants being shut down um, because they can't meet the standard. But um, in the case of uh, 
TDC, they're proposing an extremely low limit between 470 and 780 pounds per megawatt, which is great, but we don't believe it's achievable uh, unless they operate as a CHP plant. So in light of the, the University of Delaware not purchasing their steam, we think they should revisit and revise their CO2-backed analysis, um, really for their own good, um, but, but to be more accurate and, and to compare their proposed limit with other data centers, CHP facilities, and power plants. So we have some comments on the CO2 act. Um, and one last thing that they did in the application before I get into our findings is they, they have avoided um, the Delaware's um, CO2 cap and trade program. Um, Delaware is part of REGI, um, which is a group of northeastern states which have a, a CO2 uh, cap and trade program. And it only applies to power plants that have uh, 25 megawatts or greater in plate capacity. So everything that I've discussed, everything's just under 25. 23 megawatts on the turbines, 20, 20 you know, megawatts on the um, steam uh, turbines, etc. I um, don't know if that was intentional, but, but uh, it certainly was clever because they don't have to deal with the CO2 cap and trade program. Um, so that's sort of an overview of their application. What I was going to do now is talk about some of our findings kind of on a pollutant by pollutant basis and uh, then jump to some conclusions. Um, first of all, I was going to talk about NOx and DOC. Uh, they're proposing, as I said, uh, this selective catalytic reduction with a very low NOx um, value of 2 parts per million, along with catalytic oxidizers for sodium DOC and offsets. We find all of that to be acceptable. That's, that's um, how permitting is and should be done. The only sort of objection or concern we have, not objection, but concern, is the very large uh, internal combustion engines. Um, they're proposing a uh, higher NOx limit for them, even though they're equipped with SCR, they're proposing five parts per million versus two, so they're twice, as, twice the emissions of NOx um, as the turbines. They also have much higher VOC, CO, and air toxics emissions. So the vast majority of all the air toxics from the facility, which are not very high in the big scheme of things, but nonetheless, they're tons per year. And the vast majority of those air toxics do come from the internal combustion engines, not from the turbines. It's just the nature of the combustion. Internal combustion engines are not as efficient as turbines, uh, so you get more incomplete combustion uh, byproducts. So, one of our fundamental questions is why do you need these very large engines? And maybe there's a good answer for it, maybe, maybe they're needed. Certainly at smaller data centers, they operate multiple internal combustion engines in about the 2 megawatt range, 1 to 2 megawatts. These are three 17 megawatts of giant engines. Any question you need for them? Um, but other than, other than the engines, the NOx and VLC and limits that they're proposing and use of offsets all seem reasonable. Moving on to particulate matter, um, as I mentioned, one of our concerns is uh, PM 2.5. Because this is a non-attainment area, um, they're proposing close to 100 tons per year, 97 tons per year of PM 2.5. Um, this is where it gets sort of complicated. If this were an attainment area, and by the way, Denmark has proposed redesignating Newcastle <laughs> County as an attainment area. Two years ago, they proposed this. But uh, EPA takes forever to, to mm -hmm. improve things. So any day now, they may approve this area as being attainment. I've looked at the PM 2.5 uh, ambient concentrations. They've come down substantially over the past 10 years. The area basically meets, it does meet the 2.5 standards now. Uh, however, technically, you're classified non-attainment because EPA takes so long to reclassify uh, a, a county. But if this were an attainment uh, county, and TDC had come in, they would have had to have modeled PM 2.5 emissions because the significance level for 2.5 is only 10 ton a year under PSD. However, because of this technicality, the area being non-attainment, um, they could emit up to 99 tons without having to get offsets or doing that. So we have some concern about 2.5, and basically our suggestion is, uh, and this is sort of an aspirational comment, if you will, is that they either obtain offsets for these 2.5 emissions uh, in one way, shape, or form. If they're only available, make some available. 
by retrofitting school buses, trash trucks, that sort of thing. Or, uh, in the alternative, uh, if they don't want to go out and can't um, obtain offsets, uh, conduct modeling for 2.5 and show that the impacts uh, meet what's called the PSD increment, which is a fraction of the National Ambient Air Quality Standard, to basically show that this facility will have an insignificant impact on PM 2.5. So, that's our concern with uh, 2.5 is sort of they slip between the cracks um, because of the attainment status of the county and the sort of vagaries of the research review program. Um, air toxics. Uh, we looked at their risk assessment. They conducted an inhalation risk assessment. We've done reasonably. The cancer and non-cancer risks are very low, well within federal guidelines. Uh, our, a couple concerns we had. One is they didn't model all of the air toxics. They chose the few risk drivers, formaldehyde, acetaldehyde, acrolein, which is fine. They, they certainly do drive risk in general. Um, but our suggestion was they look at other HAPs as well, other air toxics as well. Um, and also that they obtain guarantees from the catalyst vendor for formaldehyde reduction. Um, we do this routinely. Catalyst vendors are used to it. They can provide it. I think I saw something in the press, uh, TVC, stating that they can't possibly get vendor guarantees because this they have to wait until the permit's issued, and then they can tell the vendors what they need. Well, that's not true. It, it, you can, and, and we always do, get when we can guarantees from um, pollution source vendors, that would be the, the gas turbine vendors, GE, Mitsubishi, et cetera, uh, the engine vendor, and from the catalysts that are going to control the emissions. So our suggestion is that you guaranteed emissions use that in their risk assessment along with assessing other air toxics. And the big picture on air toxics is if it weren't for these internal combustion engines, their air toxics would be negligible. They very little from the combustion turbines. More than 90% are from these um, large engines. Um, let's see. Next pollutant. Um, Ammonia. As I mentioned, uh, their ammonia slip is very high, 7 parts per million versus 2 to 5 in the industry, sort of a standard. 70 ton per year of ammonia emissions is high. They did conduct a modeling assessment and concluded that you wouldn't be able to smell it, it wouldn't be a nuisance. Uh, but nonetheless, ammonia uh, is one of the precursor pollutants to PM2.5 formation. Um, I, I know too much about PM2.5 because I've written some papers on it, but, but more than half of PM2.5 in ambient air is in the form of ammonium sulfate and ammonium nitrate. The sulfate and the nitrate are from socks and knocks from power plants, sometimes hundreds of miles upwind. And then the ammonia um, combines with the socks and knocks to form these, these aerosols. So ammonia is in fact a, a precursor pollutant to PM2.5. Um, so it's kind of ironic, they're controlling NOx, which is a big problem with ozone, and yet emitting ammonia. It's sort of inevitable, but the comment is that their slip level is, is too high, and it should be tightened up, and the vendor should be able to guarantee lower levels. They should be able to drop that ammonia at least in half, in our opinion. Um, the other issue with ammonia is risk management plan. Um, RMP, it's called, if they were proposing anhydrous ammonia, they would have to conduct an off-site risk assessment to see what would happen if their ammonia tank and handling system uh, failed and there was a cloud of ammonia um, flowing off-site. Um, they've avoided that. Uh, a lot of people do this, again, cleverly by, by proposing aqueous ammonia with a, a ammonia concentration of less than 20%. Uh, so technically, they're not subject to RMP as a listed pollutant and capacity. However, there's a general duty clause under the RMP program that requires you to assess each and every hazardous um, chemical to see if there's a potential for off-site consequences. There may not be. With anhydrous ammonia, depending on the size of the tank, they may not have that, that possibility. But our suggestion is they conduct that analysis to see if the aqueous ammonia could impact uh, uh, neighboring facilities or properties. Uh, again, the use of ammonia, aqueous ammonia or urea is, is inevitable with SCR. You just have to have that as a reagent to make the catalyst work. Carbon dioxide, um, they have very high emissions of carbon dioxide, so they've, they've gone through this fact analysis. Uh, we're questioning the 
viability of the CHP concept. Um, uh, we certainly think it's a good idea to use as much steam as they can in the data center. So to some extent this will be a limited CHP project, but will it be a full CHP with the efficiencies they're claiming? We don't think so, unless they can find uh, a host for all their, their low pressure steam in the winter. Um, will they meet the combined cycle gas fact? We think so. So we're not quite sure why there's a need for CHP from an air permitting perspective. Certainly from an economic perspective it might make sense, but I'm sure it does make sense and perhaps from public relations, but there's really no need for the CHP concept. Uh, you know, they don't need to be the greenest, cleanest um, facility out there um, in order to pass the CO2 backed provisions that EPA is going to be looking at for this facility. Um, so, you know, we've, we've got some comments on the CO2, but ultimately their combined cycle configuration is as efficient as you can get for a standalone gas power plant. Um, oh, one other thing with CO2, they did not conduct a cost analysis for carbon capture and sequestration. A lot of facilities go through that exercise. Uh, now, I, I'm 95% sure that exercise would conclude it's too costly to capture carbon and eject it underground. I say that based on looking at multiple um, permits in Texas where there is a place to put CO2, you can put it in oil wells. And uh, each and every gas fired power plant I've looked at that are twice the size of this have concluded that it would cost um, uh, hundreds of millions to compress, capture, compress CO2, pump it somewhere where it might stay underground. But nonetheless, it's a deficiency in the application that they did not cost the CCS. At least EPA calls it out as a deficiency um, in Texas. I don't know if they will here. Uh, one last thing on emissions and my findings. Um, comparisons have made between this facility's proposed emissions and Chrysler's emissions and emissions that would occur on the grid if this uh, data center were to operate on electric from the grid. Uh, in my opinion, the, these comparisons that have been made are, are misleading and disingenuous. Um, first of all, TDC is a new source of air pollution. It's subject to Bacton layer. Um, it's not an existing grandfathered source. So it's completely different. It's sort of irrelevant what was there before. Um, it's also irrelevant what emissions would be in the grid. And making a comparison and saying that the air would be cleaner here in Newark um, by putting this power plant in versus if they just use electric off the grid, um, that's just incorrect. Unless they do a complete modeling analysis and say, where are the power plants that are going to produce the electricity that this facility is going to use? And trust me, they can't do that. It's very complicated. PJM spends you know, thousands of hours figuring that stuff out, and they still can't do it. But even if they did that, they would have to do a detailed modeling analysis to show that the emissions increases from a coal-fired power plant in Western PA really has an impact in Newark versus a power plant that's right here. So a comparison between their proposed emissions and the grid average emissions from PJM, I think is just, just very misleading. Um, so ultimately, I think these comparisons are really irrelevant unless and only if TDC is proposing to use Chrysler's emissions offsets. There may be something to be said for uh, comparing their emissions with Chrysler's you know, NOx and VOC emissions if they're going to purchase their offsets. I don't, I don't know if that's the case. They don't say in their application where they're getting the offsets from. Usually buy the cheapest ones available. So, anyway, just, just a comment on these comparisons that have been made. I think it's been a way of um, trying to uh, promote the project some, but it really has nothing to do with, with air permitting, where they have to deal with the emissions they're proposing. So, in conclusion, I have a few conclusions, recommendations I made in my report. Um, again, as I said at the beginning, um, they're proposing a relatively clean plan for a fossil fuel fire power plant. Uh, they're, they're proposing state-of-the-art pollution controls. However, bottom line is it, it, it's not a green facility. It's not renewable energy, it's fossil fuel, and their CHP claims are questionable. Um, it is cleaner to some extent than most data centers to, to the extent that they're using gas versus diesel. But as I said, data centers I'm familiar with, and there's a few very large ones in Washington State, operated by Microsoft, Yahoo, 
and you're talking, they're, they're on the grid. They're using electric, reliable electric power. And this is in eastern Washington, so it might be more reliable than it is out here. Uh, but they typically have 10 to 20, 1 to 2 megawatt backup diesel generators. They're permitted for 100 to 200 hours a year, not for 24-7, 8,760 hours a year. So although they're going to use gas, they're going to be clean, um, they're going to be a power plant that run all the time, um, as opposed to most uh, data centers which have 30 year diesel engines, but they don't run all the time. It's the cleanest facility, you know, these large IC engines, internal combustion engines, uh, are large, they propose to operate them all the time, and they're um, certainly more polluting than the combustion turbines. Their particulate matter, ammonia, and air toxics are too high in comparison to other gas power plants. Um, we think they should revisit their CO2 fact. And I have uh, a few comments on their air quality impacts or sort of recommendations. Um, as I mentioned, their impacts appear to be fairly low, but we're recommending some additional air quality assessment be done. One thing we didn't look at was start up and shut down. When you start up or shut down um, these combustion sources, uh, the catalysts don't operate optimally until they come up to temperature. So they have proposed um, very high um, uh, transitory short-term emissions during startup and shutdown events. Uh, they might take 20, 30 minutes, an hour, but nonetheless you have much higher um, NO2 and air toxic, um, a variety of air pollutant emissions uh, during these startup and shutdown events. For a base load power plant, it doesn't really matter because they're starting up shutting down a couple times a year, but for a plant like this, where it looks like they're going to cycle through many um, different sources, there's a potential for a lot of startups and shutdowns. So our recommendation is that they model impacts, so certainly for NO2, which has a one hour national ambient air quality standard. For some of the other pollutants, 24 hour or annual, it, it doesn't matter as much. Um, but for NO2, where there's a one hour standard, um, these short term events could be a concern. And so we're recommending they model it. They did not model um, there comprehensive modeling of background sources for PM10 emissions uh, we have some concerns with. Uh, they didn't, there's a bunch of technical, they didn't model background sources as potential to emit, they, they modeled an actual. So their, their modeling analysis is, 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 is not very conservative. At the end of the day, they may still be fine, these, these are sort of minor technical comments. The bigger comment we have on air quality impacts is we believe they should um, conduct uh, pre-construction monitoring um, to better understand background concentrations, particularly for PM10 uh, in the area. Uh, this is a common requirement for major new sources. Um, it's also common that they wait, that states don't require pre-construction monitoring. But the idea behind pre-construction monitoring is to collect at least 12 months worth of monitoring data that's considered by EPA to be representative to establish background concentrations. Because what you do when you're modeling is you're looking at your impacts, plus other people's impacts, plus background, uh, and comparing that with the national ambient standards. Um, they use background data from Philadelphia for PM10. Why? Because there is no PM10 data available in Delaware. Maybe because it's an older pollutant. Uh, there's less concern with PM10 nowadays. But our contention is PM10 data from Philadelphia is not represented in the area. To be honest, I, I would guess PM10 levels might be lower here, but I don't know that. Um, but uh, the other reason for pre-construction monitoring is a twofold. One is to collect meteorological data. You can put a weather station in with your, your pollutant monitoring, and that provides on-site representative meteorological data that you can use in your computer modeling analysis. Uh, TDC used data from the nearby airport. Not usually a problem, especially in a flat, relatively flat state, as long as the land use is similar around the airport to where it is um, at the Star Campus. Uh, and I certainly would have done that as a consultant. It's much easier to use uh, airport data than it is to collect your own. Uh, but that's the other reason for pre-construction monitoring is to get representative um, meteorological data and winds can vary depending on where you are, the highways, etc. And use that in the, in the modeling. And the third key for pre-construction monitoring is post-construction monitoring. You, you look at levels before your plant goes in, after your plant goes in, and you sort of prove that the impacts are low. Computer modeling is just an estimate, it's a model. Monitoring is the real thing. You can see what the pollution levels are before and after a project. 
So it's not unheard of. Uh, many, maybe most, new large power plants have to collect this data. Uh, one thing TDC has going for them here is you're in a flat area. There's no hills and complex terrain. You can make the argument that background data from an airport a few miles away is fine. And there may be monitoring data available from the MREC site a few miles away, and then that's representative of the area. Um, but we firmly recommend that pre- and post-construction monitoring be done for this project. Um, our other recommendation, which is, as I say, perhaps aspirational, might not be required regulatory-wide, is that they either obtain PM 2.5 offsets for the 97 tons they're proposing, or they can have modeling for PM 2.5 to show that their impacts are not significant and they meet what's called the PSD increments. And again, um, I think we have some regulatory basis that's pretty considerable for those recommendations. Um, but at the end of the day, DENREC has discretion here to require or not require free post construction monitoring, the modeling, and the offsets. Um, from my standpoint, uh, the offsets and the 2.5 impacts uh, certainly would be uh, a good neighborly thing for TDC to, 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 to address. Uh, finally, in air toxics, air quality impacts, we think the air toxics should be reassessed, as I mentioned earlier. One final comment is monitoring. Uh, we haven't seen the permit yet, and I fully expect NREC will, will require continuous monitoring and uh, routine testing, but TDC only proposed monitoring for a couple of pollutants, so we're um, suggesting that continuous emissions monitoring be done for other pollutants, so ammonia, CO2, for example. Uh, there's certainly precedent for that at other uh, power plants. And we firmly believe annual testing should be done. But believe it or not, many large sources get built and only have to do what's called stack testing once every five years. Initially, when they build the plant, and then once every permanent renewal cycle, which is typical five, typically five years. Um, in the case of a power plant like this, reliant on catalysts and equipment that can and does degrade, uh, oftentimes we get guarantees from turbine and engine vendors that are only good for you know, 4,000 hours uh, because stuff could de degrade. We think annual testing is, is uh, very important um, and also continuous catalyst monitoring uh, to make sure the stuff doesn't degrade over time. And that's a summary of my comments and recommendations. Thanks for your patience. All right, we'll now I'll proceed with questions and our comments from members of council. Um, I'd like to know who, who are the experts that uh, you said state of the art technology? Who makes this technology for the catalyst? Well, there's several catalyst manufacturers out there. Muratech is one of them, MIRA, TECH, Muratech. Um, uh, there, there are many out there. But what we do from an air permit perspective is we look at precedent. So there's database um, EPA maintains on the back of the determinations that have been made around the country for different size types of sources on a fluid by fluid basis. So we usually go to that RBLC database first and look at um, where emissions limits have been set. So in the case of NOx, if, if you look over the past 20 years, you'll see NOx limits go from 25 parts per million on down to 10 to 5, now they're 2 parts per million, and the vendors will guarantee to those emission rates. So <coughs> what you do with the back for layer analysis is you do a, a case by case evaluation of how low well can you go. You look at all the available pollution controls. Um, you look at them the, on an efficiency basis, you rank them, and then you determine which ones are technically feasible. You can knock out some based on economic feasibility for back and after layer. So you go through this whole top down analysis on your back and determine that you, you're using the state of the art controls. So what we did was we reviewed TDC's back analysis, which was very difficult to review. It's scattered, but uh, it's in there, deep in their application. And we agree with them. Uh, for the most part, but in several cases we disagree and think they can go lower based on our review. You said in this country, um, is there technology in other countries in Europe that uh, would have a different impact on what's here? There 
can be. Um, I'm not aware of any when it comes to a mine cycle gas fired power plant. I certainly see much more stringent um, pollution controls for things like crematories. I have scrubbers in Europe that we don't do. So there can be. Um, when it comes to power production, it's pretty universal simply because everyone's um, you know, using electricity and there's World Bank standards. With the exception of coal, uh, we're, we're way ahead of other countries, including most European countries. But, um, but to answer your question directly, we have not looked at European gas fired power plants or data centers. Okay. Uh, um, do you recommend a different? You said there's a lot of pollutants come from one particular type of turbine. Is there another type of turbine they could use that would be able to create the same amount of power and have a dramatic effect on water pollution? No, they are proposing the most efficient type of turbine. Uh, it's a very dry NOx style of turbine which has low NOx emissions to begin with based on the combustion uh, uh, technology. There are three vendors that are usually different. There are differences between them uh, in terms of what they guarantee. Mitsubishi, 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 um, and what happens is, despite the fact they have different emissions from the turbines, once you go to the catalyst vendor, they'll all guarantee the same emission rate output. So we haven't seen a significant difference among turbines <coughs> in the size range. Once you go to a 200 to 300 megawatt turbine, um, they're relatively thinner. I have one other question. In Europe, they purify the air before it goes into the turbines, and they said that will dramatically reduce, it'll create a better burn rate and dramatically decrease pollutants. Is that type something you would possibly recommend? That, that is, that's a very good comment. I'll, I'll look at that. They, there are all, there's always filtration. Generally, there's filtration prior to combustion of turbines just to protect the turbine blades from dust, etc. But the degree to which they're proposing filtration is a good question. I'll, I'll look at that. There's no detail on the filtration there that they're proposing to use for this stuff. I can't hear you. Sorry. That's all I have. Thank you. Sorry, I was just saying that I'll have to look into the filtration. Redesign this project to eliminate the engines, they would take a lot of 
how to make sure in particular enterprises. Yes. You made a comment along the line that the um, engines would probably have <coughs> higher pollutants and lower loads. And it's my understanding that the engines are in there to accommodate varying loads. Um, so it all seems like the situation is even possibly worse than they would um, like to indicate. Could you comment on that? Um, yes, IC engines are inefficient at lower loads and have higher emission rates on a pound per kilowatt basis. That doesn't mean they have high, higher pound per hour rates because at 50% load you have half the kilowatts. Yeah. So even though the pollutant rate is higher, the load is lower. Um, but the bottom line is uh, the IC engines operate most efficiently with the lowest emissions at 100% load. And so something that puzzles me about this project, and I'm not an expert in data centers or, or uh, interruptible power design, quite frankly, but one of the things that puzzles me is why Microsoft proposes uh, 30 smaller diesel engines for backup. Uh, versus this project where they're proposing three extremely large 17 megawatt engines. It would seem to me that they're going to rely on the engines in the early phases of this project, they're going to run it at low load at times, uh, which is not as efficient as running smaller engines at full load. I'm sure there's some economies of scale uh, cost-wise, but uh, that puzzles me that they have very, very large engines that might run at uh, lower loads and be less efficient. Okay. I, uh, I do have a question regarding the drift eliminators. A statement was made at some point that proximity to the stacks, the closer you were, the less likely you were to get the particulate matter was good was what was going to happen here. But with the drift eliminators, it sounds like that's not a true statement. Is that so? Well, the turbines and the engines, uh, last I saw they are proposing a 165-foot stack. Um, it, that depends on the model. They, that could go higher. It could go up to 210 feet, I think, is the maximum. That's allowed nowadays. You can't build four or 500-foot stacks anymore. Um, but with regard to cooling towers, yes, they're low. I think they're going to be 45 feet. So they don't nearly have the height of the dispersion that the combustion sources are going to have. But on the other hand, those cooling tower emissions are much, much lower. I think they're a fraction of a ton compared to the 90 tons from the combustion sources. So even though the cooling tower will be lower emissions, I mean, lower height emissions, and more likely to have an impact at proper length, the emission rates are much lower. Now, visibility, plume interfering with traffic, that's a different story. I, we haven't evaluated that. There are power plants out there that operate with mechanical coolers and no water cooling, uh, no cooling towers whatsoever. They're very expensive, but you don't have to deal with the water, you don't have to deal with the uh, plume, but you take a hit on energy because you've got to run the electricity for the mechanical coolers. But it is possible that So, uh, do the drift eliminators, is that intended to eliminate um, just drift to PM, or, or is it also the visual appearance of steam? You know, I don't know the answer to that question. I, I know they do remove particulate very efficiently, um, but I do not know what their impact is, if any, on visible, visible emission. I just thought about that tonight. I didn't know what the purpose was. <laughs> um, and we also had a question um, about like, what's the critical distance for the dispersion of the um, air pollution based on a stack of, like, say, 165 feet. I don't know, in, in your experience, can you share with us some other similar combined cycle power plants, what their stack height is, and what you're thinking the critical distance of you know where this um, where the emissions may most affect either the city or a neighboring downwind uh, property. Well, I, I hate to say this, but as a consultant, uh, I'm going to say it, it all depends. It depends on the modeling now. 
depends on whether there's nearby hills, which we don't have here. Um, we have one. We have one nearby hill that's not too high. It's just a small. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, hills you have higher impacts for sure if they're close to the stack, depending on wind conditions. You know. But I'll tell you what: the applicant did a modeling analysis and can produce what are called isoplat plots. They may not want to, but they can produce isoplats, which will show concentrations um, in, in the surrounding terrain. And you can see from that if there are any hot spots where the highest modeled impacts would be. Uh, where everything just drops off uniformly. In their modeling analysis, I think they showed the one point where the maximum impacts were going to be. And it depended on the different uh, scenarios they looked at. The full bore versus the normal operations. Uh, but it's a lat launch. It's very difficult to envision. And to be honest, I didn't look at how far it, it, it's probably in their application of distance. But uh, what would be quite helpful, I think, the public would be if they produced isoplat plots showing where concentrations are highest, how high is high. Um, in the case of Microsoft, um, with their data center out in Washington State, they did just that. They also looked at the other nearby data centers and looked at actually cancer risk because they were looking at diesel particular. Um, but I think that's a useful way of presenting modeling analysis. Um, tables are very difficult to right. yeah. I remember trying to understand what that meant without the, without the graphs. So it, it all depends. If they go with higher stacks, you know, they're going to move the impact points further away. Uh, so it's all a balance of how high your stacks are, dispersion characteristics, and neurological conditions. So, so I mean, that's a complicated way of saying I don't know. Yeah, yeah. I mean, on, the, on a scale, though, are we talking miles or tens of miles? Front, you know, within a kilometer, like. No, my, my experience is that maximum impacts are uh, with combustion sources like this are within within a quarter mile. Oh. Uh, maximum impacts. Now, when it comes to when it comes to fugitive dust, which they haven't estimated any, uh, or the cooling tower emissions, those impacts will be maximum at the defense line. Oh, and right on there, probably. Yeah, because yeah. they have no dispersion to speak of. So dust emissions, low emissions like the cooling tower, they will be, the impacts will be close. Okay. Um, but the, the, the stacks make it complicated, that's why we do all of them. If you would please refrain from talking so the recording works properly. There's a question that I asked you in private before, but could you talk briefly about um, aqueous ammonia versus um, urea and any effect that might have on slip? Yeah, my, my experience is, is uh, you need ammonia to have SCR, have the catalyst work, and the catalyst doesn't care what form the ammonia comes in, because what you do is you spray anhydrous ammonia aqueous ammonia or a urea solution into a very hot exhaust, 800, 900 degrees, you atomize it with the sprays. So once it hits that hot exhaust, the urea dissociates into ammonia, and it's the ammonia that's the reagent, the active agent. So from an effectiveness standpoint for SCR, uh, my understanding is there's no difference uh, between the anhydrous, aqueous, and, and urea. There certainly is a difference in the safety of handling and storing urea safer than uh, aqueous, safer than anhydrous ammonia. But as far as effectiveness, I'm not aware of any difference uh, when it comes to the actual SCR performance. And did I catch correctly that you said um, they were guaranteed typically for 4,000 hours? Um, excuse me, for, for ammonia oh, yeah. slip? Uh, no, for the catalyst. Oh. Uh, well, let me clarify. I was looking at engines, uh, natural gas engines, I have quite a bit of experience with. And uh, their emission guarantees, now they're not equipped with catalysts. Landfill gas is too dirty for catalysts to work. But the engines themselves have NOx and CO emissions guarantees. And typically they are for between four and 6,000 hours. After that, um, the, the, the vendors will not guarantee emission. Now, that, that I, I must clarify that's in the context of landfill gas, which is 
a corrosive, potentially nasty material. It could be, in the case, and probably is the case, with the gas engines and the gas turbines that are going to guarantee them for a lot longer than that. Um, catalysts, though, do degrade and can be poisoned. And so every guarantee I've seen for catalyst has a lot of caveats uh, on the sulfur content of the gas, um, halogens, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So I, I should clarify that, that when I said 4,000 hours, that was for landfill gas. Okay. okay. It's sort of filthy fuel being used in, in, uh, in, in, in engines. It's probably the case that they'll get guaranteed for much longer than that. Hopefully they will like the equipment. I don't know that for a fact. We have no guaranteed emission rates anywhere in this application. Thanks.